Hello, hello, and welcome to another video. In this one, we're going to be talking about functools.lru cache, which was brought up in, I don't know, a recent stream of mine where someone was like, what does that code do? What is that thing doing? Uh, so let's, let's jump into it and explain it. Okay, so for today, I'm going to be building a little Python file. Um, so first off, we're going to be importing functools. That's where this, this comes from. Import func tools, and we're going to be making a function that is decorated with the LRU cache decorator. And if you want some more information on decorators, I did a video, I don't know, a couple months ago now uh, about the about you know decorators in general. Uh, but we're going to be talking about the specific func tools .lru cache decorator today. Func tools .lru cache, and if you're working in Python 3.8 or above, you don't need to put parentheses after this. So let's just I'm just going to start with the most basic use of it first, and then I'll show you some ways that we can adjust this decorator. Um, and we're just going to have a very simple function here uh, that's just going to, you know, square stuff, float to float, um, just as kind of an example here. Uh, we're also going to print here so that we can see when our function code is actually running. Um, and we might as well put the, you know, x that's running here. Um, so let's first start by running this code without the LRU cache decorator. So if we do python 3-i t.py, you can see that if we run square of 2, which should give us 4 is our answer, uh, and you'll see that when we when we run it, it's always printing this little running text saying that you know, the code is running. It's actually doing stuff here. Um, but if we attach this decorator now, and we run square, the first time we run this function, you'll see that it prints out that it's running the code. Uh, but every invocation after that won't actually run this print. Uh, and so what's happening here is it's being cached. And LRU means least recently used, which means that uh, basically the most recent calls will get cached. And if it needs to do eviction, so if it needs to forget about some of the cached values, it will forget about the oldest calls first. Now, I believe the default for LRU cache is like a, a size of like 128 or something. Um, and so like, you know, we wouldn't easily be able to show that in a, in a video here, but I'm going to actually adjust the size of this cache. And we can do that by uh, changing this to a call here and we can pass in max size of some value here. So let's say we want to max the size at three. Now you would probably pick a max size that produces a good trade-off for whatever application you're working on. Uh, so like, I don't know, maybe you're caching a call to retrieve a user account and maybe you know that you you know, max out at a thousand users and maybe only a hundred of them are active and so you might pick a cache size somewhere between those two. Um, you can also say max size equals none if you want the cache to grow indefinitely. You'd probably also compare this against like how much memory you actually have available on your server. But anyway, let's show this with a max size of three. So if we call square of two, uh, you'll see that this gets cached. If we call square of three and square of four, you'll see that it's also running those. And if we call square of three again, that one's still cached. And square of two is still cached. But now if we call square of five, because we have a max size of three and we only had two, three, and four in our cache, one of these values got evicted. And if we look at our most recent calls, uh, we called two, then three, then four. So that should mean that four is no longer in our cache. So if we try square of three, square of three, and square of two, you'll see that those two were both cached. They didn't produce the like the cache miss value, uh, the cache miss output. But if we call square of four again, you'll see that it had forgotten that cache value. It had been evicted. Um, but that's, that's basically how LRU works. Uh, some other tricks that you can do with LRU cache is you can create kind of a global singleton-like function. Um, so maybe uh, we have a function that's like get thing, and it takes no arguments and you know returns some. Uh, in this case, let's just do an integer just because it's easy and like pretend this is expensive. Pretend this is expensive. No. And if we do functools.lru cache on this. Uh, by default, this cache size will be like 128 or something like that. I don't know, it's in the documentation. Uh, but in our case, we're only ever going to be returning one value. So that large cache is actually kind of wasteful uh, and we can force it down to a size that's more manageable. Uh, in, our, in our case, a max size of one is the exact amount that will only ever be in this cache. And so you can see 
um, um, print expensive. And this allows us to kind of make a function that will act as like a, a singleton value. And so every time we call get thing, uh, well, the first time we call get thing, it runs the expensive thing. Uh, but after that, we're always getting the same value back. And I actually use this pattern in pre-commit to do some, you know, kind of expensive calculations on um, in the, which language is that for? Ruby? Yeah, I think in the Ruby language. <clears throat> yes, in fact, right here. This is actually where it came up in my <laughs> in my stream. Um, I'm caching the value of get default version because uh, this find executable call here can be you know, a little bit expensive. It has to go to the file system and, and figure some stuff out. Uh, but this value doesn't ever change, so we can just cache it indefinitely. So I'm, I'm using max size equals one. Basically the same as this pattern here. And that's kind of the basics of LRU cache. There's one other thing that you might need if you're writing tests for a function which is decorated with LRU cache, since you probably, you know, you probably want to actually validate that uh, the function is working. And if you need to do some mocking or stuff or change the the uh, you know the shape of the memory that's running at that time, um, LRU cache makes that a little bit difficult. But you can actually access the func the underlying function by accessing double under wrapped. So if we go to square dot double under wrapped, uh, this will return our original square function so that we can call this without dealing with the cache at all. So you can see if we call square dot wrapped with two, it's always going to print that running side effect instead of, you know, um, let's, okay, that's on screen, cool. Uh, so you'll, you'll always get that side effect instead of, you know, going through the cache portion. But anyway, hopefully this was useful. Hopefully you have some appreciation for functools.lru cache and can find some other places where you might use it. Uh, oh, another note is this is new and I want to say Python 3.4? No, Python 3.2. Uh, so you'll you'll probably need to either use a backport or something else if you need to use this in Python 2. Uh, but why are you writing Python 2? It's 2020. Anyway, <laughs> if you guys have additional stuff that you want me to explain, leave a comment below or reach out to me on the various platforms. Uh, but thank you for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one.